You can adopt some of my own for a while until you figure out where the Lord's leading you. But this is the spirit and the tenor of our church. And what we're trying to do is not simply do what we do, but also understand why we do what we do. So in Hebrews chapter 12, we'll get there this, this morning in just a moment as we finally get everybody in the room. And when we do, we'll close those doors, gentlemen. And again, passing out bulletins all a long way. But once we think we've got everybody in, we can shut the door and that'll be fine. But we've gone back to establishing things about the fact that God is a spirit. And if we worship him, we worship him in two ways. In what? In spirit and in truth. We say the word spirit, that means that only the redeemed can worship God. You cannot worship God if you are not saved. And so as we think about that organizing principle for our church, we realize then that we don't organize worship for the unredeemed. We, work, we organize worship for the, re, for the redeemed to worship God. If you understand that, we say amen. Again, we're developing a theology of worship in our church. Why we do what we do, God willing, according to the dictates of the Bible. So we worship God in spirit. Folks must be saved to truly worship God. Therefore, we don't have to worry about organizing services to attract unbelievers. That's God's job. If we lift up Jesus, he will draw all men unto him. If you believe that, we say amen. So nothing that we do, short of, again, we have, we have a responsibility to go into all the world, preach the gospel. I believe we need to get back to doing a much better job just inviting people to church so they can hear the gospel. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I wonder how many people actually invited someone to church this week. Think about that in your own life. Think about this. When's the last time you invited someone to come to church? Uh, that's a real sense of your desire to fulfill the Great Commission. If you can't remember that, that's not a good sign. <laughs> that's not a good sign. And when's, let me ask this. When's the last time you gave the gospel to someone? Uh, that's, by the way, that's a good big reason why we're still breathing God's air, right? We're glorifying him and reach the world with the gospel. We're thinking about things that organize our lives. So we worship God in spirit that's only for the redeemed, and we, we, again, all people are welcome. That doesn't mean we're keeping anybody out of these meetings. As long as people behave themselves and don't try to disrupt, they're welcome in these meetings. Now, if they don't behave themselves and they do disrupt, there's the door. We've got some people that will help them find that. If you believe that, we say amen. We try to be kind to people, but we're not going to have people disrupting uh, the, the services and people disrupting uh, what God's trying to do here. We can't allow that sort of thing. Just like in a class of children, if one child's disrupting, you're going to remove that child from the class. Someone will deal with them while they're, so we can instruct the rest of the children. That's how you take care of that so they don't miss out on the truth. We do the same thing in big church as we do in children's church. Amen. So the redeemed, as I'm going a long way to talk about all of that, the redeemed. So never get under pressure to think we've got to update this so more people will want to come to our church. That is foolish thinking. That's foolish thinking. We've got to update the way we do this, the way we do this, the way we do this. That's, that's, not what's, that's not what's drawing people to Jesus. That's, that's true, it's true, it's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. That's not what draws people to Jesus is lifting up Jesus. And so uh, it's about the, that idea of you worship in spirit. You worship in truth. That means truth is communicated in words. Say that with me. I want you to finish the statement. Truth is communicated in words. And so our words are important. Colossians chapter 3. And again, I'm going, going back to remind ourselves here. But we have words that, again, that have depth. They have right doctrine. They promote the right deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. All these things. They even fit a certain distinction as we think about psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And that word spiritual songs gives, gives uh, rise to a broad category of songs. No question about that. But, but we still take whatever the category the songs fit in. And we hold the words to a certain standard. We'd want to hold the words of a song to the same standard we do to a Bible lesson or a sermon. And even though it's much harder to rhyme words that way, <laughs> it's more appropriate to stick to the right doctrine and the right view of God in order of trying to cheapen those things in order to produce some sort of poetic or lyrical rhyme. That We wouldn't want to do that. We want to stay away from that. Hold, hold it to the same standard. So truth is communicated in words. The words are important. We've talked about that in Revelation 4 and 5, words, the word saying and the word singing. In, verse, in chapter number four, I think in Dr. Master's book, it says, let the Lord define worship. That sounds appropriate, doesn't it? Because he's the one that's receiving the worship. He's the one that's receiving it. So he, he's, make, he's, he's given us examples. He's given us all these sorts of things. The last time we came together two weeks ago, we talked about the sound of music, instruments and all that. And there's a lot to say about it. Even though we're not under the same rules and regulations of the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is the principle of restraint. I want you to remember that when it comes to instrumentation. 
the principle of restraint. Not that people are bound up, but it, this idea of restraint is connected to this idea of reverence that comes out of the word of God. Not that there'd be an un, unleashed uh, effort in the music that would overpower, and the sound of music that would overpower the words. And we're reminded this about the sound of music. Sound, the music sound carries a message in itself. The sound of music carries a message in itself. And so those are things that we've, we've talked about, things that we've considered up to this point. All those things now bring us to this. Maybe you could say this is the organizing principle of it all. But in Hebrews chapter 12, I'm, I've asked you to turn there a little earlier in the meeting now. It says here about, uh, this is a verse you'll, you'll re remember, I'm sure, very well. Verse 28 and 29. At the end of it, it says, it says, says wherefore, uh, let me say this, go back to 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably and reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. Reverence, we're talking about reverence for God, a godly fear of God. And so I don't think anyone would disagree, no matter what, where you're at on the spectrum, that God is, should be reverenced. If you believe that, we say amen. amen. But we have completely forgotten what reverence is. Uh, reverence is, 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 is a, it has something to do with seriousness. It has something to do with some soberness. As sometimes it is somber. doesn't mean you have to be sad all the time. But reverence. God is to be reverenced. And not just in the four walls of this church building. He's to be reverenced in our lives. Reverence is supposed to be the tone of the Christian life. It's the tone of the Christian life. But if it's not happening in our worship services, it will not happen at home. And one of the reasons we've seen it, we've seen reverence fall by the wayside in the personal lives of Christian people is because we have left reverence out of our corporate gatherings. And make no mistake, when you leave reverence out of the corporate gatherings, it will fade away in the personal lives of Christians. That makes sense when you say amen. So if you want to know why everything is put under the umbrella of worshiping God and church today, it's because reverence was lost in the corporate meetings of God. We've done away with it. I, the word lost is very generous. We haven't lost it. We've put it away. We've put it away. When we lose reverence in our corporate meetings, we're going to lose reverence in our personal lives for God. And, if, and we already agree, God is to be reverenced. He is to uh, be served with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So this is the issue. We've been, we've been guilty of, I would say, we, we, we put ourselves in the category. Even when we're thinking about it, we're trying to do our best. We're not holding ourselves up as a standard for anyone or anything. But as in general, in Christendom, amongst Christians, in the generation we live, and really it's been for more than our generation, many people have tried to remodel God into something that looks more like them, only just a little bit higher than them. But that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is high and holy and lifted up. As train fills the temple, we've referred to Isaiah 6 many times throughout all this. He's still the same God. I know Isaiah's in the Old Testament, but he's still high and holy and lifted up. Yes, he did condescend in sending Jesus to earth. He became like us, took on our flesh, but he did not sin. He is without sin, and he, paid the, pay, he had to be without sin so that he could pay the perfect sacrifice on the cross. And he did all of that, but he became one of us, but God is high and holy and lifted up. And so we, we're, many people are, are clamoring that they can to have a God that's on their level. And so what that does is it does away with the, the necessity of reverence. What does reverence mean? Dr. Master tells us, that gives us this definition in this chapter here. It says, it literally means with downcast eyes or great humility. Downcast eyes or great humility. Fear means, uh, means caution. doesn't mean necessarily that you're afraid, but it means you're cautious. And while there's no question that we ought to have a loving uh, relationship with God Almighty, and we can run into the Father's arms just like the prodigal did, we do so still with reverence and with fear. With reverence and with fear. So, again, it's reverential. That fear and reverence taught all throughout the New Testament. I could give you many examples here. Cornelius of Caesarea, Dr. Masters referred to, visited by Peter, acknowledged by all to be one who feared God. Even Cornelius, before he understood all about Jesus, feared God. When preaching at Antioch in Pisidia, Paul appealed twice to those that feared God, using that same sort of term. 
The people who, who truly receive the word, fear God, wrote Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2. And so fear God is, is what the angels promoted in, in the book of Revelation. Uh, look with me at Revelation chapter 15 for a moment. We're not too far away from there in the book of Hebrews. Revelation chapter 15, I believe Dr. Masters indicated verse 4 here. It says here in verse 4 of Revelation 15, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, and thy judgments are made manifest. This idea of fear, reverential fear. Look, look a couple of chapters over, four chapters over in chapter 19. In 19 and verse 5. It says here, and a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Reverence, respect, fear, uh, deference is exactly what is due to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Reverence, reverence and fear. If you, uh, Dr. Master says this, uh, if reverence deficient worship soon leads to Christians who are shallow in commitment, seriousness, depth, and even holiness. And uh, I believe he's right about that. Reverence and worship is paramount for believers and must be maintained. First Timothy chapter 4, if you'll go there with me for just a few moments, and we'll move around a couple of uh, different selections uh, from the Word of God. We want, obviously, uh, we, as we, we thank God for what Dr. Masters is giving us, but this is based on the Word of God. Again, a book like this, any book that we use in our Sunday School Bible studies, um, is not meant to take the place of the Bible. It's meant to enhance and strengthen our study of the Bible, our understanding of the Bible. First Timothy chapter 4, if you don't mind to have your hand there, and then we'll look over in a couple of the verses as well. I believe that's still in my Bible. I should have marked it before I came to see you this morning. First Timothy chapter 4 says this, and verse number 7, verse number 7, it says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness for bodily exercise profiteth little but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation and it says here that uh, some important things that we need to take note of a faithful saying worthy of all expectation this is talking about a necessity the need uh, for a teaching and understanding of a reverence toward god Again, these are key words in the verse. The key word in the verse is godliness. Uh, they know that word godliness. It's a word that we're not we're familiar with. It, it refers in a general way to righteous character. Uh, they were called Christians first at, at Antioch. That was a derivative, a, 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 a disparaging term, I should say, as they talked about Christians being little Christ, but people who were given that name wore it proudly to be a little version of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're to live a godly life, then we're to live the life that we believe God would live if he were living on this earth. Godliness is, is a, a part of our, is, is our life. It's part of our character. It's who we are. Paul exhorts uh, then to exercise yourself in sanctified living, uh, and so he says this, this, of course, would be a correct thing to do, but the word godliness doesn't just mean that. It's a highly special word, distinctive meaning. It means to be well devout. It refers to our entire attitude toward the Lord. It's far more specific than righteousness, and as this is so important, we sh it, Dr. Master says this, we briefly prove the point by looking at some other passages here. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, if you'll just flip over a page there. It says here in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience. Uh, and as, as the Bible says here, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, wherein thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So godliness sits in this list of many specific qualities of those that are following the, of Christ. It is distinctive because it's listed separately from some of these other words. You know, one of the things that we, we do tend to do, and, and certainly in the English language, uh, it seems like words lose their definition, and, and many words seem to have the same exact definition. By the way, if they did, we wouldn't need multiple words. Words can be synonymous without being exactly the same. Does that make, make sense to people? And so the word godliness is distinctive. Not a general term for Christian living here as it takes its place here, but it's used in the same way. Go, go to, would you go to 2 Peter for just a moment? I'm referring to that a couple of times. Let's just read that out loud as a point of reference for us. 
2 Peter chapter 5, chapter, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 5, I apologize. Believe it or not, it's actually written this right way in my notes, and I still can't read it correctly. That, that's not a good sign, is it? <laughs> These glasses are supposed to be helping me, but I can't blame it on the glasses this time. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, if you're there, we say amen. So, again, and, and it says this, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and knowledge temperance, and, our, and temperance patience, and patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. So, we see this word, a distinctive word, godliness, is what's being said here. So, uh, godliness, again, it says a, a specific virtue alongside all these others. As we think about that word, Dr. Masters says this, the root of all our problems today is, as, as New Testament Christians is the collapse of such reverence and what he calls a new style of worship. All carefulness in God's presence and all deep respect for him has gone if we're not careful, if we don't maintain it. Uh, well, you know, we come into a worship meeting like we'll come into in just a few moments. We try to remind ourselves as we, open, as we have an open call to worship with our choir singing, God willing, and as we make our initial prayer in the meeting, that we are coming into the presence of Almighty God. We're coming in there. But it is so difficult for me and my flesh to continue to remind myself of that. And, uh, you know, if God's here, you're going to act a little different. Just like uh, children are different when Mama walks in the room <laughs> or Daddy walks in the room. We have a summer day camp here and. Just, just one more week left. We have a great time with the children. Took a great group of them on Friday out to the nursing home to sing for the Lord. It was such a blessing. Those children are here several hours during the day, and they're not perfect. Just like you, they're not perfect all day long. But one of the things that helps them sometimes, if they ever get to the point where they have to come see the pastor, and occasionally that does happen, believe it or not, um, I'll say to them, uh, and I try to familiarize myself with their parents and who they are, I'll say to them, uh, I'll call the, the name of their parent by the first name. And so the certain child walks in my office, I say, how are you? What's going on? Why is, what's the problem with all this? And they're crying or upset, whatever they're talking about. They're telling how awful life is and how evil these teachers are over there, everything that's going on. And I said, well, why don't we call so-and-so and see what they have to say about it? And as soon as I say mama's first name, the whole, a lot of, most of them, the whole thing just goes, just like that. <laughs> and I said, well, maybe mom, maybe mom just needs to come pick you up. And it, it doesn't take long for things to turn around if, if things are pretty normal. Now, occasionally, it doesn't work that simply, and thing, life's not that simple. We know that. I wish it was, but it's not. But the presence of mom changes that child's behavior. In fact, it's interesting. We have, we've had children come be picked up. Believe it or not, they, come, they have to go home occasionally. They cannot stay if they don't obey the rules. How, about, how mean is that? Oh, it's appropriate in, in, the, in the right situations, but it's interesting. By the time they, that mom comes to see me in the office with their child, I'm telling you what, you would never know there was a problem. When she walks in, she's confused, like, what's going on here? I'm like, oh, well, she's ready to go home with you. And uh, we've gone this or this and this, and we thank God we've had some resolution to it, but appreciate you coming to pick this child up. <laughs> that child behaves a lot differently, and you and I have to remind ourselves that we're in the presence of God. We're in the presence of God. doesn't mean we should feel bound up, but there's reverence and fear. Reverence and fear as we do all that. That's really the crux of everything that Dr. Masters, our brother, is teaching us here. You know, I, when we come together, we want to sense the moving of God. If you do, would you say amen? amen. If you, you don't want that today, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> I know you're, you're here out of duty and you're not looking for anything. And God bless you. I hope you'll have an awakening. I appreciate you doing the right thing, but that's a miserable way to come to church. But we all have done it. The preacher does it way too often, you know, but, um, but we want the touch of God, but, but more than that, we, more than wanting some thrill, you know, and that's, that's not a bad desire. We can't, we cannot, we cannot subtract that from our view of God, a, a reverence and a fear of God. I want you to know that reverencing God, best I can understand it by reading the Bible and certainly studying Dr. Master's good book. The reverence that we show for almighty God is not going to subtract joy from our worship is not going to eliminate happiness from the Christian life. In fact, it is the pathway to those things. You and I understand very clearly that we can have an exuberant meeting 
an exuberant meeting with a certain sound and a certain song, even a certain style of preaching. I want you to know, and you could feel really good about it when you leave, but it ain't going to take long for it. That just dissolves. After you have your, your lunch, uh, that'll pretty well be gone. It's temporary. That's the best we can do. I can get you excited with a meeting here for about two hours. When you get home Sunday afternoon, the tank's going to be empty. But if we continue to have a reverence and fear for God, he will keep the joy tank full. He will keep the happiness tank full. I believe that. So what we're doing by short-circuiting our way to feelings is eliminating the eternal impact that God wants to have in our life. And, and that, that is something we must realize. And I, I love mountaintop experiences. I love the joy of the Lord. I love it when it breaks out in a meeting. I love that. I love that. I want that to happen every time. It doesn't. But if we try to, we try to drum it up, we try to drum it up, I'm telling you what, we're going to find ourselves, we're going to find ourselves being miserable more often than being happy. That's a true statement. So you can hold it together from about 11 o'clock to 12.30 on Sunday, but the rest of the week, pretty rough. But the joy of the Lord is our strength. And again, when we have a right view of God and we maintain reverence and fear. If you think you understand that, would you say amen? Uh, my, I mean, as I say that, I'm, I'm hungry for it. As I say it, I mean, I, I get thirsty for it. I don't know about you. And then I'm, 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 I'm punishing myself a little bit. I'm, I'm talking to myself and my inner man even right now saying, why do I feel like I have to drum this thing up? I can only be myself when I preach. I can only be myself when I sing. But I, I want to have that tempered by the understanding of who God is. I don't want that to change me so that I can praise him the way I ought to. And it affects so many areas of life. This, this chapter is so thorough, so very thorough, and our time is fleeting, no question. But, but uh, Paul has much to say in the New Testament about all these things. Back, back in, our, in, our, in our reading here, we, wrote a, we read back in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Can we go back there? You know, and it's just like the Lord. Let me say this on my mind. I can't help it. Here, i got to say this. Just like the Lord, you know, he gives us his word. And then as Christians, and we're human beings, we think, we wouldn't say this, but we think we know a little bit better. Or we think we can do it this way. And, and we see some results. But, but it's just like the Lord, when he puts something in the word of God, he knows what's going to be best for us. I mean, he knows this, I, the, he, he understands that the reverential and fearful approach to God is what's going to be the actual pathway for continual joy in our lives and happiness in our lives, not having these bursts of emotion, the explosions of emotion that die out. And then, you know, it's kind of like a sugar rush. You know, you go and eat 14 Snickers bars and you're feeling pretty good. When that gets out of your system, you can't even put a sentence together. You know, maybe, that's, maybe that sounds a little coarse, but that's what I'm trying to co- equate it with. We can get, we can get it together and get, cra- get crazy happy for a while. But I'm just saying, if we want to li- live it on that diet of sugar, we're going to have a lot of deficits in our life. We're going to crash. And the Lord said, you don't have to crash. You don't have to live on the roller coaster of life if you'll worship me with reverence and with fear. And that, that's so comforting. Again, as I'm saying that, it just makes me... Hungry, you know, the Lord, I don't know how to explain it to you, but even as I read these things and study these things, and I'm sure I could be better prepared, but even while I'm saying these things, God deals with you and, and does something in your heart. He just does something. Thank the Lord for the truth. Amen. It's not about being right and someone being wrong. It's about being what God wants us to be. And then I just think about the deep well of things that God has for us when we walk his way. It's just like all the stipulations given in the Old Testament, maybe that we, we don't take the time to read, but, but the things, just for example, I think we referred to it recently about not touching a dead body in the Old Testament. So we say, what's the big deal about that? But the Lord actually was, was preserving people's health by putting some of these types of stipulations. Don't do certain things. People may have understood, but before people understood medically why you shouldn't do that, God just said, don't do it. It's the best thing for you. Just trust me. <laughs> And uh, it's just like we tell our children, don't do certain things. If you'll just trust me, it's going to be, God's telling us this about our worship. And it's going to be not only the best for him, but it'll be the best for us. So thank God for that. Uh, Where were we at back in 1 Timothy chapter 4? Refuse profane and old wives. So that word profane is pretty serious. (laughs) 
uh, to per, per, get away from profanity in the, in the, in the idea of that, and not, not just the profanity of language, but what the word profane means threshold walker. Dr. Masters puts this in the book. Someone who is free and easy to do whatever he likes. No reserve, no caution, no fear, no respect of the premises. So what he's saying is that fable teachers and these profane teachers had no reverence or respect for the sacred text. And so we, we've, we've preached this for years, but, but Paul is saying stay within the bounds of the Bible. If you have a reverence for God, you're going to stay within the bounds of the Bible. You're going to stay with it. If you don't have a reverence of God, you're going to go outside what he's given us. And, and that's very true. So no reverence or respect for God means we don't have a respect for the sacred text, and the Bible is a sacred text. Thank God for that. Again, a, a new, this new style of worship, even in this, in this chapter, gets real serious. He calls it the showbiz style of worship has been the product of profane teaching. People who are threshold walkers, they get outside the bounds of what God is doing, what God has called for. Again, I'm not saying people are doing it because they're against God, but they're, they're trying to come up with everything they can to help God. Well, let me say it this way. It's very kind of like God doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help in this regard. And, we, and people might say, I want to help people. They look so discouraged. I want to encourage them while they're here. And I, I want to sing a song this way or do something this way that encourages them while they're here. And, you know, you can look, I can look into your faces this morning and tell you need some encouragement. You're looking at my face and say, boy, he needs, you may say, I need a facelift. More, I mean, more than encouragement, I need, some, I need some medical help. I don't know what you think. But, but God is telling us how to get what we need here. He's telling us how to get it. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. This stirs my heart. And so we, want to, we don't want to be threshold walkers. We don't want to live on the edge. We want to, we want to exercise ourselves under godliness. That's what he says here. Uh, again, now it's just interesting. He, make, he makes this point, and I know our time is fleeting, but uh, reverence is instinctual for newborn Christians, he says. Now, uh, meaning this, that they have a fear and a reverence for God. They may not do everything. They may not dot their eyes and cross their T's the way you think they ought to because they're brand new at this. But their view of God is like, wow. He just rescued my soul from hell. I go him everything. He can tell me anything, and I'm going to do it. <laughs> if, I get the, if I get a whiff of a commandment, I'm, I'm in for it. Uh, sadly, the longer we live for the Lord, if, we're, if we don't work on maintaining that, we can lose that view of God, can't we? Dr. Masters gave an illustration. He said he met a medical practitioner friend telling him about his church New, adopting new charismatic songs, choruses, clapping, swaying, speaking in tongues, uh, considerable noise in the service. The doctor had a good grasp of truth, and he said, I asked him what his feelings were. He, the doctor replied that he was quite ambivalent. He's like, well, you know, whatever. And he did not mind what went on. Whether worship was conducted the old way or the new way, he felt it was all worship. If it did not upset or offend him, that re it did not upset or offend him that reverence had fallen. His instinct for reverence had virtually disappeared so this again you know why we're making this study is we want to make sure we don't lose some of the things that were handed to us because it takes maintenance it takes maintenance on our part to keep this going and you and i can rationalize ourselves out of a lot of things we're not careful we know that's true because I've, we've done it somewhat we've done it somewhat so Paul, again, as he's speaking about here, exercise yourself unto godliness, and, and we we're, to, we're to work at that, maintaining all that. The apostle's argument, Dr. Master says, is that the exercise of reverence has a broader benefit. Bodily exercise does profit, but the exercise of reverence has a deeper and broader benefit in our life for eternity. Reverence is, is stated to be immensely significant and beneficial in the Christian life, but it must begin with worship. Again, so if you're going to have a life of reverence, a life of reverence in God and a life of fearing God, as I said early on, and we're going to have to stop here just about halfway through, and that's just fine. But if we're going to have that life of reverence, if we are not conducting that here in our corporate meetings, it will not, it will, it will not trickle out into your life as you leave out of here. So it's important. That's why it's important that these corporate meetings, that we exercise these truths from John chapter 4 and verse 24. We exercise truths from Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, that we understand the principle in the Old Testament when it comes to worship and even the sound of our music, because our goal is to worship God and to exercise reverence and fear in doing all of that. If worship is stripped of reverence, 
Reverence will be stunted in all areas, other aspects of life. What begins in worship spreads to the whole of the Christian life. If worship is more like a performance, as Dr. Masters would say, with showing off, imitating the world, sensation seeking, much noise, everything for my pleasure, then reverence will not be found in any other department of life. How cruel it is then for churches to abandon reverent worship. That's a strong statement. Again, God, God is saying, if you will, you will worship me this way, you're going to get what you need for the rest of your life. You're going to get help in all areas of your life. So it would, be, it would be cruel for us to abandon it. As far as your Christian existence, the other six days of the week, it, it would, if, if what he's saying is true, and I certainly believe it. I believe that wholeheartedly. The members of, of the body of Christ will be seriously hurt and disadvantaged for their potential, excuse me, for their, for their potential and for their personal spiritual lives. And so God help us to see that. God knows, God knows what he's doing. He's not trying to shut us down. He's not trying to hold us back. He's not trying to cut us off. He's not trying to curtail our wants and desires. He's looking at us and saying, just like I said, don't touch this dead body. Just like I said, don't do these certain things. If you, will, if you will come to me with reverence and fear in these corporate meetings, and even then, it, it, it's something, that's something that will impact your life. It will part, become part of your personal life. But it will meet your need for joy and happiness all through life if you will start here with God, worshiping him in spirit and in truth, worshiping him in a, in a spirit of reverence and fear. It doesn't mean that we come into, that every meeting here is going to be like a funeral. That's not, that's not the case at all. But it's knowing when to be serious, you know. Some people have a, have a goofy personality. We won't point those people out in this room. There's, everything is funny. I, I like to laugh at lots of things. I like, to, I like to laugh a lot. I like to, I see humor in lots of people, by the way. So I, I, like, I like to point it out occasionally. It's fun. I, uh, the older I've gotten, I've, my, my repertoire of dad jokes has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger with my children. I love it. I love it. And uh, I just like adding to them. It's a lot of fun just to needle them. I love it. But it's not that you can't have a fun. It's that you can't smile, and even, certainly in church and in corporate worship. But we have to remember why we're here and who, who we're here for, right? We, we just don't want to, what we don't want to do is we don't want to forget God here. You say, how could we do that? I'm just telling you, I'm, I can do that. I think we can do that. We can even do that as we come together, right? We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. That's not what's in your heart. And so in order for that to be the case, we bring ourselves back to some of these foundational and organizing principles for Christians and certainly for the Calvary Baptist Church in Smithfield so that God will be pleased. And then thank God because of that. As we've said time and time again this morning, God will, will be precious to us and our life will be a joy-filled, happy Christian life because of it. It impacts it. And I hunger and thirst for that. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. I feel like the Lord's met with me this morning. Whew, hallelujah. It's convicted me a little bit here. He's also opened my understanding while I'm talking to you. And um, I thank God for it, don't you? Lord, you're so good. Thank you for meeting with us in this room. Thank you for the eternal word of God. And I thank you for the study help that we have in this book, Worship in the Melting Pot with Dr. Masters. He's certainly not perfect and but it's been so helpful to help us to shed some light on who you are and what you're doing. And thank you for bringing us to the realization this morning that you are to be reverenced, you're to be feared, and, to, for, and thank you for the assurance that you're giving me and my heart, and even as I speak about this again this morning, that we will not be short-circuited. We will not receive anything less than your best. The fullness of joy is what we will receive as we worship you in reverence and in fear. We know, Lord, that that doesn't mean that we're bound up, but we can bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and all that is within me. We can bless your holy name, but help, help us never forget who you are as we give you worship, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank the Lord for all that this morning. I'm gonna, I rejoice in the truth of the Lord. Let's stand together. We're getting ready to be dismissed. Choir folk, if you'll get your stuff together, I'm going to let you go first, amen, because I think you're part of the best people on the face of the earth. You're the Class A Christians right there. Look at that. Class A Christians walking out of the room. We're hoping lightning doesn't strike as you go out the door as I'm saying these things. 
And <laughs> I, may, I may need to stay in here if lightning's striking outside the door, that's for sure. But I appreciate them serving the Lord. And then the rest of us are dismissed. Thank you for being in Sunday school this morning. We'll gather in just a little while to worship the Lord at 11 a.m.